Good morning. It's time to get our service today. Good to see you. Okay, glad you're here on a cold January morning. Um, let's uh, take a moment for a few announcements. Uh, we're kind of back to normal with our schedule. We have our men's group that meets on Tuesday evenings at 7, our Wednesday uh, service at 7 as well. Um, a couple of things that are coming up next Sunday, we'll have our July and January uh, fellowship. Uh, we're going to, since it's a cookout, we're going to have hot dogs and hamburgers and so if you'd like to hang around for that if you'd like to bring uh, you know buns or chips or desserts that would be great um, we'll have that right after the service next week if you want to wear your uh, summer gear then that's okay too uh, I'm probably not but if you want to I'll let you that's a, that's a good thing so uh, keep that in mind for next week um, then in, on the 27th we'll have our annual church business meeting here uh, Wednesday night uh, January 27th and um, there's nothing oh by the way if you haven't picked up your giving statements for this year they're available they're on the table out in the entryway this morning so keep that in mind as well so those are the announcements we have for today let's begin let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, let's uh, get our hearts and thoughts on him today and focused on him to worship this morning and uh, so let's take time to do that father we're well, so good to always come into your presence Father, uh, when we say that, I know that we're never out of your presence, wherever we are. You're always with us. But, Father, we come together today as your people to worship. And, Lord, whether we're here in this room or we're at home, wherever we are, Father, we're coming to now to place our lives before you. And to, Father, be reminded of who you are and what you do in our lives. And, Father, I pray that our focus would be you today. And that you would be exalted uh, among us. And so, Lord, we just uh, commit this time to you and ask for your bless on it, blessings on it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's read God's word together. Psalm 22. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever.
Our next reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. All throughout my history Faithfulness is what beside me When the storms make way for spring Yeah. 
Let's uh, take a moment to pray. We want to pray for several in our church that are out this week. Um, pray for the Turners. They're doing well, uh, kind of on the backside of COVID and, and improving. Um, but we want to continue to pray for uh, Pam, Angie's mom. She still has some problems, a little bit more than others do. So let's pray for Pam. Uh, Kenny is home today, sick as well. Uh, pray for him and his recovery. I think the fever part's over, just uh, no appetite and just still not feeling very strong. So we want to pray for Kenny. And uh, his sister Ruth has COVID and she's in the hospital and uh, struggling with that. So we pray, appreciate your prayers for her. Um, also, I mentioned the Santa Prayer request for those you remember, Todd and Ellen. Ellen's parents both have COVID. Her dad, Eldon, has double pneumonia with that. And so really a serious situation there for him. And so we want to lift him up. And I know there are others as well that we need to pray for in that regard today. And so uh, let's pray that God would just uh, be near these that are sick and give them healing and strength and health. So let's take a moment and bow in prayer for them. Judy, would you lead us please as we pray? I want to take time to pray also today for our country as we'll be having a, a new president sworn in on Wednesday and just all the things that are happening around that that have happened already let's pray for peace and safety and for that to, to go well and uh, let's pray for our leaders as well the Bible instructs us to pray for those who are in authority over us and so we want to take a moment to stop and, and pray for our country today and pray for God's direction and guidance and for uh, uh, him to Sometimes it's hard to know how to pray, and we just need, I think, to let, and that really should be our prayer all the time, that God would have his way, and uh, so I think that's what we need to pray for today, but uh, let's take a moment, and let's pray for uh, this, this, this week that God would be with us and with our nation, and uh, I think it's right and proper that we pray for God to, to bring an awakening in our country as well. Uh, spiritually, we're in a low, a low place, I think. And uh, we need to be in prayer for that. So let's take a moment today and pray. Karen, would you lead us this week? protection. 
Let's stand and let's read God's word together. Our third reading today comes from Zechariah chapter 3. I'm sorry, chapter 13, verse 1. And on that day, a fountain will be opened for the dynasty of David and for the people of Jerusalem, a fountain to cleanse them from all their sins.
miss up there. Children to go to kids' church at this time, and uh, the rest of us are going to stay here and look in God's Word. Um, let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 15. We're going to be looking there again this week. John 15. Really thankful for our our praise team, the worship team, and they do a good job. And we've kind of got several that are. It's amazing how many, many many folks God has given us. They can bless us with with music, and so we're thankful for that. And they do such a good job. We appreciate them a lot uh, and their efforts and uh, help leading us in worshiping the Lord today. So this morning we're looking back in John chapter 15. Going to focus on verses uh, 18 to. Uh, we're going to get into actually chapter 16 some as well. Um, last week we talked about um, persecution. Jesus' words here in John chapter 15 and 16, that's the theme that he's talking about. Um, when you think of persecution, it's uh, something that it's always over in some other place. It's not really something that we deal with here. And so we don't often uh, make it a thing where we worry about that. And we do need to pray for people around the world who suffer and who are in, uh, uh, deal with persecution each day uh, right now in, very, in a lot of places around the world. Um, it's, uh, texting with a, a pastor in India this week and uh, just talking about some of the challenges that he faces that we don't have here, uh, living in a culture that is, is uh, pretty anti-Christian there. And so I think it's good for us to remember to pray for them. And when we pray, I think of today our missionaries in Bulgaria. Bulgaria is, uh, it has some Christian influence from years and years and years ago. It has um, some, uh, a lot of Muslim influence as well. And there's a, a, a good portion of the population is secular. And so there's a, a, a great need there. And so I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. And as we prepare our hearts to hear God's word, I want us to remember these people around the world that are dealing with persecution that probably can understand and, and listen to Jesus' words and under, understand them much better than us and uh, lift them up to the Lord in prayer today. So let's take a moment to bow and pray for our, uh, our missionaries and those serving in Bulgaria and then around the world as well. And uh, so let's pray for God's help and strength in their lives. Kyle, would you lead us please? Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you blessing of being able to be here in the house of the Lord today, and um, I just pray that you will lift up our missionaries there around the globe, but particularly today those that are in Bulgaria. Father, I, I thank you that they were willing to give up a life of ease and comfort here in the United States to go travel around the world to be separated from their families and their friends and country that they know and love, to go around the world to share the good news of Jesus with those who may not have ever heard it. And Father, I just pray that you will uh, strengthen them both physically and spiritually, um, help them to feel your presence and uh, know that we are here praying for them and supporting them in any area that we can. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, we looked last week at why Christians are persecuted, and I want to just touch on these real quickly, and then we'll go on to uh, what I want us to talk about today. Why are Christians persecuted? There are five reasons. The first one is the world hates Jesus, and that's what Jesus says there in verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, remember that it hates me first. And so very clearly, um, again, we talked briefly about last week about how if you look at the world religions, uh, it seems like the gospel of Jesus gets different treatment than uh, other religions and other religious leaders. And so you can talk about God all you want. You mention the name of Jesus and it changes the conversation. The second reason I think there's persecution is because we are not a part of this world. I think we really struggle with this because it, it's so easy for us just to fit into the world systems and all of the stuff that's going on around us and not to really understand that we are never to be at home in this world because this is not where we belong. And again, when I say that, I'm not talking about 
the, the world, the, the weather and the geographical ideas about the world. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the world systems, its belief systems, its, its values, and those sorts of things. And so because we're not a part of the world, then it's one of the reasons why the world responds negatively and, and persecutes Christians. A third thing is because we want to be like Jesus. If I, you know, if, if, if my goal is just to, to be Christian in name and to, to have something to make me feel good about being religious, um, and I don't take it very seriously, it's not a big deal, but if you, the Bible calls us to follow in his steps, to be like Jesus. And if I do that, then it means I'm going to live my life very differently. I'm going to um, have a very different set of values. It means that I'm not just a, uh, someone who, who only lives or has a Christian influence on Sunday, but someone who lives it out every day of the week. And so when I'm, the more I want to be like Christ, it, the more problems that's going to cause the people around me. And then the fourth reason is because the, Jesus says, because the world doesn't know him. Um, and he said in John chapter 16, verses 2 and 3, that, you know, you're going to be kicked out of the synagogues because they're going to think they're doing God a favor. You know, they're following God's will and mistreating you. He was talking to the believers in his day. And I, and I think that's even true today. There are a lot of people who would consider themselves religious, would consider themselves Christian, that probably, when faced with a true believer in Jesus Christ, would uh, have a problem with the way they live their lives. And so, because of that fact... Um, Jesus says because they don't know him and then finally the last reason is that Jesus gives here is because the Bible foretold it uh, Over and over where and we looked at several scriptures last week that talked about that um, And so it's it's one of those things where as believers in Jesus It should not surprise us if persecution comes our way because Jesus told us that it would happen But now here's the thing and here's what I want us to talk about today. How should I respond to that? Knowing that persecution is a, is a possibility, maybe in, in, in a, a probability, how should I respond to that? And Jesus gives us four ways to respond here in the latter part of John 15 and getting into John chapter 16. And the first way is that we need to respond relying on the Holy Spirit. Um, next week, we're going to see a lot about the Holy Spirit. Jesus is going to go into great detail here. And now I want you to, to understand that with the Holy Spirit, um, he is that part of God that is with us all the time. We don't have a, there's never a moment when you're alone. There is a helper. God comes alongside and he defends you and protects you and gives you strength. And here's the thing that I think that it's important to remember that we're never alone. You never face whatever you go through in your life alone. Now, persecution is different from going through difficult times and different days. Sometimes we have challenges because of health or because we lose people we care about. That's not persecution. Persecution is what happens because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to understand, no matter what you're going through, God loves you too much to leave you alone. But he promises, and notice in John 15, verse 26, that he says, but I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth, he will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And I love this passage in Mark 13, verse 11, where Jesus says, But when you are arrested and stand trial, don't worry in advance about what to say. Just say what God tells you at that time. For it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. If I'm walking with the Lord and I'm, I'm in a place where I need to respond, let the Holy Spirit be the, 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 the one that leads me and guides me in that response. Um, Anymore, it seems like we're called bigots and racists, and we're looked at as the problem in our society. Um, understand, we don't need to respond every time someone criticizes. I think sometimes we feel like we have to defend the faith. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think sometimes we just need to leave things with the Lord and let him take care of those things. Um, every generation has its challenges spiritually every generation and uh, whatever we face we understand that we walk through this with God giving us strength and help but I love that he says but when you go through these things I'll give you the words to say I'll lead you and guide you in that and I think that's a tremendous promise so when we face persecution Jesus says we need to rely on the Holy Spirit 
Um, and then he also says, not only should we rely on the Holy Spirit, but we need to be able to keep on sharing the gospel. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't let up. In John chapter 15, verse 27, he says, you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my, in my ministry. Now, here's what happens. People tell us that we need to be quiet about our faith. You know, and there are some places where if you work and you, and you, should, you, you, you know, just invite someone to church or mention the name of God, it can be a problem for you. Um, what do you do in those moments? And I'm not telling anybody to go look out and, and try to lose their job. I'm not saying that. But I do think that sometimes it's, it's real easy for us when we find out people don't like what we believe or they don't care about um, what we have to share, that it's real easy for us just to be quiet. Just to not say anything. Just to, just to go about our lives and uh, step back. But I don't think that's what the Lord would have us to do. He says here, you must also testify about me because you've been with me from the beginning. Um, in Luke chapter 21, verse 13 and 50, through 15, it says this. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you. For I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. <clears throat> I think there's, I remember many years ago now, there was an uprising in, in China. And uh, one of the most, out, to me, one of the most outstanding moments was a, one young man standing in front of a row of tanks. The tank tried to go around him, and he would, if it went to the right, he would step to the right. If the tank went to the left, he would reposition himself and stand. I don't know about you. I have a lot of respect for someone who believes strongly enough to put themselves on the line for what they believe. It says that it's not just talk. You know, we can talk religion, and we can talk God. It's a whole other thing to live that out. And to me, it's impressive when someone stands up, not in a belligerent way, not in a mean way, not in a mean-spirited way, not in a way to, to put somebody else down, but they stand for what they believe because it's important to them. And I think that's what the Lord is calling us to do here. I think if we do that in an arrogant way or a mean-spirited way, we're not doing it in the right way. I think we need to stand for the right things, but we need to stand in the right way. Remember in 1 Peter, Jesus, or Peter told the, the, the readers of his letter that always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have. But he told them two things, but he said, but do this with gentleness and respect. And I think when we live our lives for the Lord and we want to stand up to, for what we believe, that's how we need to do it. Not arrogantly, not mean-spirited, but with gentleness and respect. And I think that God will give wisdom that can't be contradicted in those moments. One of my favorite passages along these lines found in John chapter, excuse me, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Let me set the stage a little bit for you here. In John chapter 3, or excuse me, in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray. And uh, that was their church. They didn't really have buildings back then. The church met in the courtyards of the temple. And so they're going up to worship. And as they go, there's a, a man laying beside the gate who's been um, crippled since all of his life. And he's there asking for money. And Peter, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the guy's asking for money. And Peter goes over and grabs him by the hand. He says, I don't have any money for you, but what I have, I'll give you. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And so Peter pulls him up on his feet, and immediately this guy can walk. And so he's, and you can imagine, he's, He's excited, so he starts jumping and hollering, and pretty soon there's a crowd gathers around. And so Peter just, uh, everybody's wondering how this guy's been able to do this. They knew him, and he's been laid there for years begging for money, and all of a sudden now he's walking and jumping and yelling. And, and uh, so Peter just says, you know, you guys wonder what's going on. Let me tell you what happened. And so he just preaches a sermon, just tells them about Jesus. Well, the, the religious folks are walking along, and they send some soldiers over. They arrest Peter and John. They haul him into the jail. And uh, they uh, don't know what to do with them. And that brings us here um, in verse 13 of chapter 4. He says, uh, Luke writes here, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John 
for they could see they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. And I love this part, this particular line. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. The, the leaders are stunned by their defense. They, they, they understand these guys are not, they're not rabbis. They're not, you know, religious theologians. They're fishermen. But yet at the same time, they answer with such wisdom and such grace and knowledge that it's amazing to these guys, these religious leaders, that they have that ability. And I love that part where it says they recognize that they had been with Jesus. That's the key to your life right there. You see, I think a lot of times we want to stand up for the Lord without the Lord leading us and guiding us, and that doesn't work. Everything that we do in our lives should flow from our relationship with Him. How I live my life every day, how I do my work every day, the, the way I am in my relationships, everything that I do should flow from my relationship with Jesus. And that includes how I respond to others. And finally, in verse 19, they're not sure what to do, so they finally decide, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to, you know, scold them real hard, and we kind of have to let them go. And so they basically tell them, whatever you do, don't preach in the name of Jesus again. Stop your preaching. Stop, you know, just be quiet. Live your life. Go ahead and have your meetings. But when you're out in the, the public square, just be quiet. And this is what Peter says to them, or Peter and John says they replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? That's a good question. That's a good question for us all. Who do you think you should obey? God or others? Now, oftentimes there's no conflict, but sometimes there's going to be a conflict. In those moments, who do you listen to? Peter says, we cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Now, here's the thing. Peter and John, they had lived through the cross. They had lived through those three days when Jesus was in the grave. They had seen him alive on Easter. Their lives had been radically changed. And this is news that's too good to keep to themselves. And so to obey the Lord, they have to tell what they've, been, what they've seen, what they've experienced for themselves. And I think this gives us a good indicator of how we should live our lives every day. Um, I think sometimes we look at persecution, we talk about those things, and it would be a frightening thing. I can't imagine what it would be like to have someone bang, come banging through our doors this morning and, and uh, arrest us and haul us off because we're here to worship today. We live in a country where we have religious freedom guaranteed, but there are a lot of people who don't have that. I don't know about you, I've often wondered how I would respond in a moment like that what I would do. And it's real easy for me to stand up here and, you know, tell you, well, I would stand strong and I would, you know, God, the honest truth is, I don't know. I've never been confronted with that. And uh, when the prospect is jail or be quiet, it, I suspect it's kind of easy just to be quiet. If it's, but even on our, our jobs, be quiet or lose your job. I mean, that's a pretty big threat. And I just say in this moment, I'm not saying you need to have a response. You need to do what the Lord tells you to do. You need to honor him. You need to live your life for him and not worry about what others, how they're going to respond to that. Now, I think we do need to be concerned what they hear from us because I always want to be a good reflection on the Lord. I always want to draw people to him. And so I want my response to be such that that's what happens. And so I think that's what he's telling us here, that we're to, to not step back, but to step up. Sometimes the most powerful witnesses are those that are done in moments when everybody else would just assume we'd be quiet. Um, but don't be afraid of what you believe. Um, you know what? I've found other folks who are not believers, they're not too afraid to share what they think. So why should we be quiet about what we believe? And uh, so I think that's important. There's a fourth thing that Jesus says in verse 1 of chapter 16. He says, he tells us, don't stop following. Don't stop believing. And notice this verse. I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. Here's what happens in persecution. 
happens all the time. In fact, you read the book of Hebrews, or the letter to the Hebrews, that's exactly what was happening. The writer of Hebrews is writing to people who were, had made profession of faith in the Lord, but persecution was coming, and so they just started backing off. People started dropping out of church. They started getting away from the things of God because the heat was on. And the whole letter of Hebrews is written to encourage believers to stand in their faith, to not be afraid, to not be moved away. And that's exactly what Jesus is telling us here. Don't abandon. Don't, this is not the time to stop believing. Stand for what you believe in. Keep on believing. Keep on trusting. If you stop believing in him, what else are you going to have? Where else are you going to go? And we're going to look at that more in just a moment. And then finally, Jesus says to remember what is said. Remember the words of him, of Jesus. And he says in verse 4, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you'll remember my warning. I didn't tell you earlier because I was going to be with you for a while longer. Now here they are. This is the last night before the cross. The, everything is about to change literally within just a few hours, three or four hours. Everything is going to be different. What he's talking about is going to start coming to pass because Jesus is going to be the first one that they come after. So this is going to be a very real lesson. And he says, when you get in that moment, remember what I said. Remember my words. Remember what I taught you. And I would say the same thing. That's, we need to be students of God's word and know God's word because when those moments come, we need to know what God said. We need to stand on what the scriptures say. Most every situation, we don't have to wonder how we should respond. If we know the scriptures, he's already told us how to respond. All we need to do is do it. Um, we've had it so easy in our country for all of these years. There have been people that have paved the way for us to have the freedoms that we have. It is our turn to stand up for what we believe and to take advantage of the freedoms that we've been given that have been handed to us and to hold on to those freedoms and to not allow them to be taken away. And I do believe we're in that moment in our country's history right now. And I believe it's time for godly people to say, no, this is what we, this is the rights that we have and it doesn't really matter the laws that you make, we're gonna be God's people first and foremost. Remember his words, remember what Jesus said. Now, I think a, a, a final question that we need to ask, one that comes to my mind, is why do this? Why go through persecution? Why would somebody, a pastor in India, why would he preach the gospel knowing that it's, it's likely that someone's going to attack him physically or attack his home? I mean, it's one thing if, 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 if I'm in the way of fire, but it's another one that brings my family into it. There are pastors today and around the world that are being arrested. Their homes are being taken. Um, this is not, to, it's so hard for us because we don't, we don't live in those circles and we, as Americans, we tend to have such a narrow focus on things. These are our brothers and sisters in the Lord and we do need to care about that. But why would they go through that? Why would you, wouldn't it be easier just to be quiet? Just to, to shut your mouth, just to, to kind of take it, and just to go forward with, with uh, whatever is happening around us, just to go along with that. Why would you stand up? Well, I think there's three reasons. And the first one is this. Jesus is the answer. Where else are we going to go? Jesus dealt with this with his disciples. He's preaching a sermon one day, and he's talking about being the bread of life. And how that if you're going to be a follower of Christ, of the Lord, you have to... In his, he says, eat my bread, eat my body, and drink my blood. He was talking about that symbolism of, 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 of communion, but that idea of receiving him and living for him and having him be a part of your life. And when Jesus started talking that way, man, the crowd started walking out. They started leaving in droves. And so he turns to the disciples and he says, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and added, or asked, are you also going to leave? You can almost hear the, the, the concern in, in Jesus' words there. But I love Peter's answer. It says he replied, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words that give eternal life. 
We believe and we know you're the Holy One of God. Peter's saying, what, we're going to go back to our old life? We're going to go back to fishing? We're going to go back to what we were before we met you? That's the kind of life we want? The reason we followed you was to get away from that. And so I, I say, one of the reasons why we go through it is because where else are we going to go? Are we just going to give up and abandon our faith and, and, and give up on what we believe about the Lord and go back to living the way we used to live? Let me ask you about that life. How did that work out? How good was that? I think sometimes we want everything to be without cost. And if that's the way you feel, following Jesus is the wrong choice. There is a cost in living for the Lord. Now, I'm not saying you earn your way to heaven, but I think once you identify yourself as a Christian, there's a cost in following him. And Jesus has done a good job of identifying that cost for us here in John 15 and 16. But if we believe that he is the only way to heaven, if we believe he is the only way to be right with God, what else are we going to do? Where else are we going to go? But there's another reason, I think. I think it's also an opportunity for great joy. James writes these words. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come on your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I, I just always, if you just stopped right there, that, it wouldn't make much sense. How can going through difficulties, going through hard times, being persecuted, how in the world can that be a reason to give me joy in my life? He goes on to say, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance is a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Here's what happens. When you live out your faith, your, your spiritual muscle grows. This is January, and the, the gyms are full of people trying to get in shape. They're lifting weights, and they're eating right and all that. By 1st of February, half those people are going to be gone. They're, you know, the memberships will still be going on, but they won't be in the gym. But you remember how, what it's like when you first try to get in shape and hit the weight room for the first few days? If you've never done this, this is one of my problems with lifting weights. And I, I'm one of those, I, I'm one of the give uppers, you know, I'm good till January, but then February I'm kind of not so much into it anymore. But you know what happens? The first day you feel pretty good, you get in there and you pump some iron and you're feeling strong, you're feeling good, man, it's all great. You get up the next day and everything that you lifted, the muscles you used to lift, man, they all hurt. And you got to go hit the gym again. And you know it's going to hurt. And that's where a lot of us drop out right there because it hurts. And you have to work through that part and let your muscles get built up. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a disgusting thing. But when you lift weights, your muscles tear so they can grow. And that's what hurts. They're going through that repeated tearing process and healing, tearing and healing, and your muscles are getting bigger. You're getting stronger, even though it hurts. James is saying that's exactly what's happening with your spiritual faith, with your walk with the Lord. When you live for God and you walk with him every day, at the beginning, it's kind of tough. It's a bit of a challenge. But as you follow him and as you walk with him and as you stand for him, you start building some spiritual muscle. And instead of having pain, it's starting to replace, and then you get the benefits of, just like the benefits of getting in shape. After a while, it's nice to be able to get out on the, the trail and run three or four miles without, you know, heaving your guts up. And it, it, it feels good to be able to run and, and enjoy the air, and, and your body feels good, and your muscles feel good. And, but you have to get to the place where you allow yourself to get in shape. Spiritually speaking, a lot of us are flabby. <laughs> we need some spiritual muscle. And that's what this is about. It's to develop muscle and strengthen us. And I believe, here's the, one of the, the amazing things in life for believers. As you get older, the physical body starts failing you. And there's not a whole lot. You, you, can, you can prolong, you can do some things to, to keep that from happening, put it off a little bit. But sooner or later, time's going to catch up with us. That's the way this life is. But spiritually speaking, that's not the way it works. I can continually grow stronger in the Lord every day so that I am at my strength spiritually my last day on this planet. And that's the way I want to live my life. That's the way I want to go out, man. I want to go out strong, living for the Lord to my last day. And that's what he's talking about here. You can... 
Consider it joy when you go through these things because it's causing you to build your faith. Your faith is growing and you're getting stronger. It's amazing when you risk that first time and witness to someone about the Lord. The next time it's, I mean, you get a taste of that joy of doing that and the, 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 the thrill of being bold enough to share with somebody what you believe and how important Jesus is to you. And it becomes easier to do the next time and you become more excited about it. And whatever we do with the Lord, it, it, it's getting through that initial uncomfortable part and sharing what we know to be true. And so it's an opportunity for joy when we go through persecution in these times. And then finally, the third thing is I believe this is what it means to follow Jesus. If you're looking for another kind of life, you're, I don't know what you're looking for. Notice what he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. Now, you know, if all you want is religion, pick one that doesn't matter. If you just want a place to go and spend some time thinking about, you know, maybe uh, reading things in, in the Bible or in the Quran or whatever, pick a religion. I don't think it matters. But if you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to be a Christian, and, and by the way, we need to be careful about that name Christian, because nowadays that does, so it's kind of gotten watered down, hasn't it? The word Christian was first given to the church in Antioch. You remember how it happened? They, man, that church was on fire. They were rocking. People were being saved. God was working through that church. He was calling missionaries out of that church. They were on fire for God. And the Bible says that people around them began to notice. And the outside world started calling them Christians. You know what they meant? The word Christian means? It means little Christs. Little Christs. When they saw these folks, they thought, these are people like Peter and John. They've been with Jesus. They're like him. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's not some title I get because I joined a church. It's not some title I put on myself because I'm not Muslim or Jewish or some other faith. To call myself Christian means I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And so my life becomes his life. Every day that I live, I think about becoming more and more like him. I've shared with you already, my prayer for, has been for a while, and especially for this new year, is that myself personally, every day that I would be more like Jesus. I want God to change my life and make me more like him. It's a process. It's a challenge for me because there's some things in my life that I need to change and that God is working to change in me. But I don't want to just be a Christian in name. I want to be what the Bible describes here. He says, he is your example. Follow him. What does it mean to follow him? It means to do what he would do. What would Jesus say? I need to think about that. What would Jesus do in this particular situation? I need to think about that. How would Jesus live his life? If you're going to name the name of Jesus, this is what it's about. If you're expecting it to be easy and just to rock on through, here's what a lot of people do. They kind of want him, they, you know, they, they like the, the hope of heaven and, and some of those nice things, and they want all their problems to go away, and so Jesus sounds like a good alternative. And he is. But understand there's more to it than that. By the way, I don't live for the Lord because I have to. I, I find that if there's things in my life I have to do, I don't do it very well, don't do it very long. But when my motivation is because of love for him and because of what he's done for me, man, that changes the way I live. This is not something I have to do, it's something I want to do. It's the way I want to live my life. And so I think the Bible is calling us as believers today and the passage that we've looked at and the Jesus words that we've looked at, he is calling us to follow him closely. 
Now, what's that going to look like in your life? I don't know. You're going to have to figure that one out. It's not my job to stand up here and tell you how to live your life every day. It's my job to point you to Jesus for you to get on your knees before him and to ask him to make you like him. And the struggles that you have are different than the struggles that I have. There are things in your life that, that they're different from mine. But the goal is to be like him. To think as he thought and he thinks. To love as he loves. To act as he acts. To be his arms and hands reaching out. And I think that's where we are when we talk about persecution. Understand we are to follow him. Your path may not lead you to persecution. Uh, but don't think that there won't be a cost somewhere along the way. The day will come when you'll be asked to stand when it's hard. If you're not ready for that, if that's not what you want, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but you're in the wrong thing. It would be a lot easier for me to stand up here and wrap up this sermon this morning and say, God loves you and he's going to bless you and he's going to give you everything that you've ever wanted. All your problems are going to go away. All your worries are going to go away. It's just going to be one big love fest from here on out. No problems. But I would be lying to you because Jesus' very word says, in this world you will have trouble. They hate you because they hate me. It sounds to me like there's a little bit of a fight here, a little bit of a battle, right? So if we're going to be true to the scriptures, we have to understand Jesus' words. I'm calling, and I'm more than me, the Holy Spirit is calling us today to follow him, to be his believers, to be his followers each and every day of our lives. I am not a prophet. <laughs> I'm a, a pastor. Um, I can see days ahead in our country where I believe that persecution will come. I could be wrong. But I don't think so. I don't know when that's going to be. I don't know who it's going to affect. But I do believe that it's going to be a day when it's going to be time for us as Christians to stand up, even when it hurts, to trust the Lord in what we believe. To walk with Him, even when it costs my prayer is for you that you'll be ready for that day. I hope you're praying for me that I'll be ready for that day. That we'll stand not in fear, but in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that we'll glorify our Lord in that moment when that time comes. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father, our time is in your hands. Our future events that are going to happen, Lord, there are a lot of things. There's nothing about the future that we know except what your word tells us. We don't even know what's going to happen in the next five minutes, much less the next five years. We see things happen around us all the time that just amaze us. We would never have thought we would have seen. And yet it's here. And so, Lord, I pray that you would prepare us, prepare your people for what is ahead Lord, whatever those days are, whatever they're like. Father, that we wouldn't face the future with fear or depression or discouragement, but Father, we would go forward boldly and strongly in the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that we would be more than just someone who mouths words from a book, but someone who lives their lives according to the one who gave his life for us. May we honor you every day by the way we live, by what we say, by how we act, by the way we treat other people. Father, may we bring glory and honor to your name. I pray that you would make rejoice the church that you want us to be. Change us. Do whatever you need to do in us, Father, to make us the body of believers that you want us to be. You've done so much for us, Father. We owe you everything. 
May we echo the words of your servant Paul when he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to everyone who believes. May we live in that power every day. I pray for these here and those who are watching, Father, that you would just empower us for this week and for the days ahead. Help us to live for you and you alone. May our lives bring you glory and praise. We pray this in Jesus' name.